Welcome to Lingthusiasm, a podcast that's enthusiastic about linguistics. I'm Gretchen McCulloch. And I'm Lauren Gorn. And today we're getting enthusiastic about absurd hypothetical linguistics questions. But first, our most recent bonus episode was a chat about the design of IPA charts and how the international phonetic alphabet is arranged. We talked to Lingthusiasm's resident artist Lucy Maddox about designing a different take on the IPA chart that is going to be available for you on posters and lens cleaning cloths and various other items. Those lens cleaning cloths are a special offer for our patrons, so head to patreon.com slash lingthusiasm by October 5th to participate in that special offer. Gretchen, I've been reading What If 2 by Randall Munro, who does XKCD, and I'm delighted there are a couple of linguistics-related chapters in that book. Yeah, there's this fun one about like how long it would take to read all of the laws, mm-hmm. which it seems like a massive task. Including a fun digression as to whether a Pokeball is an egg. This very much reminds me of the, like, is a hot dog a sandwich type question. Hmm. Legal minds will debate, I'm sure. If only there was more linguistics content in that book, though. Well, you know, Lauren, as it happens, I have Randall Monroe right here, and he has some linguistics questions to ask us, as if we were starring characters in What If 2. Amazing. Welcome, Randall. Hi. Uh, thanks so much for having me on. I know I've met you, uh, Gretchen, in the outside world, but it's really exciting to meet you here for real uh, inside this podcast. <laughs> Welcome to Lingthusiasm headquarters, as it were. We are delighted to answer your hypothetical linguistics questions. So there are a lot of things that have confused me about language, and English has some weird features. So I was wondering, so if I'm in a government hearing after this where they're questioning me, and if they ask me, are you now or have you ever been a guest on Lingthusiasm? To which you would have to answer yes at this point. Right. But my question is, why the awkward repetition? Like, why does English make us specify whether the thing happened now or in the past? Like, why can't they just say, are you, were you a guest on Lingthusiasm? I mean, there are definitely some languages that do things like this. So in Chinese, for example, you don't have to specify the time in a statement. Like, you can say the time, but you don't have to say it, which is like one of the parameters on which language varies. But the specific legal question also has stuff going on in it. It's partly because legalese is a technical variety of English, but it doesn't always just use technical vocabulary that makes it seem opaque. It also uses everyday words in a way that have really technical and specific meanings. And some of that is because legalese is about this process of building laws on top of each other and historically layering them. So a word that has a really common meaning in general develops this really specific meaning in the legal context. I also think it's because lawyers have this very sort of pedantic approach to language and like looking at every single like comma and potential for ambiguity, because in realistic language, like we tolerate a lot of ambiguity and we sort of figure it out from context. But the whole thing with laws and trying to get it exactly on your side is not really allowing space for context and trying to pin everything down really precisely. Well, I was thinking about it. If I wanted to create that ambiguity, like if I wanted to ask are you in Nova Scotia now or have you been there in the past? Like, how would Mm -hmm. I do that? And I I couldn't figure it out. I think in ordinary English, you might just ask one version of the question, like, have you ever been to Nova Scotia? Have you ever been on Lingthusiasm? And then someone would just answer that with, uh, yes, in fact, I'm there right now. (laughs) We're trying to be helpful to each other in conversation in a way that law doesn't necessarily start from the same premise of being helpful. It's starting from the premise of being complete. And starting from the premise of being actually kind of antagonistic. (laughs) Deliberately unhelpful. Yeah, it's sort of like an adversarial approach to language rather than the cooperative approach we normally have. Yeah, that makes sense. Making it clear from context that you are asking about both the past and the present, even if you're only specifically referring to one of them. Yeah, because like, if I say like, have you ever been interested in linguistics? Yes, I still am. Like, it's still sort of true, but in this legal sense, you might be like, no, it's not that I was before, it's that I am now. Like, it's just sort of like trying to catch people out in being incredibly pedantic. If you wanted to add a way in English to make that explicitly ambiguous, like if you wanted, if I wanted a way to say, you something, something, 
lingthusiasm guest. Is there a natural structure that you would add if you were in charge of revising English? Well, I mean, one option you could do. So, like, English technically has only two tenses, past and non past, because you can say something like, tomorrow I go to the airport and, like, I fly to this place. And so you can use what's often called the present to refer to future events. So, if non past is sort of the more versatile English tense, you could just sort of make a special rule that's like, you don't change it. I think probably the most realistic English way would be to try to add an auxiliary. So like the future in English is often formed with will or gonna. So you could have a new one of those. Like, are you sort of Lingthusiasm guest? Oh, or like, you ever a Lingthusiasm guest? Yeah. Yeah. You could use, maybe use ever into, like dropping the verb would help <laughs> entirely. Or yeah, like making some sort of some new version of like wood or sorta or something. Just a new tenseless version of English. Yeah, just delete all the tenses in general. I feel like that would keep the lawyers even busier. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm curious about the sounds of English. I know there are some sounds that are merging together, like the distinction between caught and caught in some dialects. Are there any sounds or phonemes that are currently like in the process of coming into English or disappearing from it entirely? There's one that is disappearing and becoming a ghost before our very ears, which has millennia of history, which is what is known as the wine-wine merger. The wine-wine merger? So that WH word that is pronounced by some older speakers or speakers of very fancy registers like RP as hua. So which, having a bit of a whine over my wine. As you can hear from both we and Lauren, we both have the merger. <laughs> we have absolutely merged these. They are indistinct for us. Which and which is a very forced distinction I have to make. But for maybe like grandparent to great grandparent generations at the moment you do find it for some speakers which is a form of a sound that goes all the way back to proto-indo-european wow it made it all this time and now we're the ones killing it off we're killing it off right now wow so it's kind of neat because in Proto-European, there was a qu sound, KW, which in modern Romance languages has become QU, but still pronounced qu or k. So this is like in like quando or qua, or some of these words you might know from French or, or Spanish or, or Italian. And all these words that have K in it became H in the Germanic set of words. So you get things like cornu, as in cornucopia, became horn. Oh, yeah as in Horn of Plenty. So there's all these words that have, have a K sound, which is sometimes written with a C, sometimes with a Q, and those all became H. So this is why we have all these words that begin with WH, who, what, where, when, why, and the exceptional how. Those are the same as the qu words in those other languages, because that K became an H, and then the H and the W swapped positions at some point, because people decided they liked it better. And then, like, not quite the H stopped getting pronounced, but the H influenced the pronunciation of the W becoming wh rather than, mm, I don't even know how you do it. <laughs> now it's just sort of merged back with that W that we have. Whoa. And it's so widespread that the WH set of question words in English are all K words, even in languages like Hindi and Nepali, which are over in the Indo-Aryan side of that language family. So you get Kina, Ko, Kaire. Oh, so it's really old. Yeah, but so that's why that H is there, even though most people don't pronounce it. And I think you're more likely to get sounds enter like one variety of English or disappear from one variety of English. And then sort of that change spreads for a long time and it takes a while to like get there, get to all of them. So you still occasionally find wine and wine as distinct or more often you find it distinct in Scotland, mm -hmm. a lot of Ireland. And apparently older speakers in New Zealand have been slower than Australians and Canadians and Brits in dropping this. Yeah, that makes sense. I know a few people who have that distinction too, but like you said, it does tend to be older people. Although I always find it funny. I I always answered those dialect quizzes saying that I pronounced C-O-T and C-A-U-G-H-T the same. Mm -hmm. And then someone, I was describing this merger to someone and they said, no, you don't. <laughs> Say it in a sentence. Uh. And, and I said it out loud and I realized I had... I'm inside me. I, ha I didn't hear how it sounded from the outside. Okay, so, say say the words. Like, I caught him sleeping on the cot. I caught him sleeping on the cot. Oh, you absolutely say those differently. They are very different. Yeah. 
I would say I caught him sleeping on the cot. Yeah, I, I was born in that pocket of Pennsylvania where when I looked on those dialect maps, that area is one of the unmerged areas. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and like all of these sorts of splits, like, you know, dropped for whom or added for whom, like Indian English has a bunch of retroflex sounds, like all their T's and D's are produced with the tongue sort of curled back onto the tip of the mouth. So, you know, that's entered one variety of English, but, you know, it seems probably unlikely it'll spread to all of the other varieties, but who knows? One can hope, because I would <laughs> love to be able to distinguish between a retroflex and a non-retroflex. Too late for plasticity of my phonemic inventory, but... For future Englishes, it could be exciting. <laughs> They're cool sounds. Can you practice the sound just enough that you can convincingly convey it to other people who then learn it from you as if it's like and it becomes natural for them? Deliberately raise a family of people who have these distinctions. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I've always thought it would be cool to come up with some sort of, I don't know, like conlang or something you could teach a kid or some sort of array of like, here's like three languages you could teach a kid that would give them the maximal number of phonemic distinctions based on those languages. Because like Germanic languages actually have tons of vowels cross-linguistically. Like a lot of languages have like five vowels or three vowels or maybe seven. And English has like 14-ish, depending on the dialect. And like German, like I think Norwegian, Dutch, also all Germanic languages have tons of vowels. So if you're like, okay, you want to include one Germanic language for the vowels, and then you want like a language that has tons of consonants, like maybe hmm. Ubik. Something around the Caucasus, for sure. Yeah, something around the Caucasus for consonants. And then maybe a language with like lots of tones, like Cantonese has more tones than Mandarin. So like maybe give them mm. Cantonese so they get tone. And then you have like this nice sort of array of, you know, this will make it easier for you to learn any other language because you've got like most of the major sound distinctions. Those three are good because you also have a really good spread of a language that's isolating and doesn't have a lot of morphology through to one with middling. English is very underwhelmingly average. And then those Caucasian languages do tend to have really good morphology. So be typologically satisfying on multiple fronts. Yeah. So raise your kid to be Cantonese, Ubik, English, trilingual, and they'll be all set for their future language learning. I, th I think we've sa said everything unuseful to say <laughs> about that question. So say we're playing a game. I'm going to pick a random North American English speaker and ask them a spoken or written usage question like, how would you say this? How do you pronounce this? How do you write this? Now you get to pick someone else to ask the same question to without knowing what it's going to be. And if your person mm -hmm. gives the same answer as my person, then you win. Now, who would you pick if you wanted the mm. best chance of matching a random person? Hmm. Would you pick like a, a news anchor, a kid, or like a nondescript middle-aged person, a, or like a writer or something? I think I have an answer. Gretchen, who would you pick? So I think this is really complicated because I want to know like what's the spoken or written usage question that you're asking them because I think it would depend what are the parameters that this varies on because if it's an age-based usage question that I'm asking then I want to pick based on age but if maybe it's like geography that's more relevant or like urban status I think you'd probably want somebody in sort of like a mid-sized city because language change tends to happen faster in urban centers and slower in rural areas so you want to sort of split the difference but not one of the mid-sized cities that has like distinctive stuff going on. Like Pittsburgh has got a whole bunch of stuff that's been documented for it. So yeah, I'm like, what are you going to do for a gender? I guess you sort of want somebody who's around the middle for a lot of statistics. Mm -hmm. You know, sort of middling in age, not too old, not too young, middling in types of city. I, I don't know. What do you, Lauren, do you have a more specific answer? Oh yeah, I'd pick a lexicographer. <laughs> <laughs> and you tell them what the game is? Well, I think because of all of the people who have to think about and understand language usage, I always find lexicographers have a really solid appreciation for what is in the mind of the average language user. And so they'd be the first group of people that come to mind for me. So I guess we want someone who's at the intersection of being a lexicographer and all of those demographic details that Gretchen was suggesting. I mean, I think that's probably Corey Stamper, right? Because she's sort oh, of there we go. Uh, one of the youngest lexicographers, but young for lexicographer is like, I don't know, probably 40s. And I think she lives in a mid-sized American city. <laughs> okay, our answer is Corey Stamper. Done. There we go. Nice. You know, Gretchen, I realized as you're answering that, there was a project in a Midwestern newspaper ran a contest to try to find the most average person in the country. Huh. And they did exactly the procedure you're describing, where they picked a city that was like the most midsize, that was like in the middle on a whole bunch of variables. And then they had the town like vote on who the most representative average person in the town was. 
And they picked this one guy. And he owned a hat store, I think. <laughs> And then they were like, we found America's average man. And then they took him around to show him a bunch of stuff and get his get the average man's opinion on this and that. Sort of proto Joe the plumber experience. It must be really good to track down the most average person because they must be a, a wealth of marketing insights. Well, I was also trying to answer the question for gender, because like you can sort of pick an average yeah. age, you can pick an average location. But for gender, I, I do actually think that there might be benefits in choosing a non-binary person, not necessarily because non-binary is like the average of men and women. But there was a really interesting study by Chantal Grattan on how non-binary people talk in different types of circumstances mm -hmm. and how they can like adopt features that are associated with multiple genders from that sort of axis. So I think, again, if we're looking for versatility, which is sort of a reason for picking a lexicographer. If you're a non-binary person working in lexicography... We want to hear from you. We've got a great game to play. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So if I say it's 3 p.m. and hot out, what is it in that sentence? <laughs> Because the more I think about it, the more it hurts my head. So that's a fun question because this it is doing something that's, as you may have noticed, sort of semantically meaningless. Like that's not the same thing as I ate it, which where it refers to, you know, maybe some cake, maybe an apple, a physical object that you can point to. The it in it's 3 p.m., it's hot, it's raining is just there because English really hates it when sentences don't have a subject like a real physical subject that's there that you've said, hmm. even if it doesn't mean anything, English is not okay with that. There's lots of languages that will happily say something that would translate into English literally as, is 3pm, is hot, or is 3pm and hot, and therefore there's no it there. And because it's not there for its meaning, it's just there to fill this spot in a sentence. It doesn't matter that it is filling the role for being 3 p.m. and hot. It is just there to tick a box. And in fact, this is so odd in English and such a quirk of English that it has a name, which is dummy it. So wait, you could attach that it both to the 3 p.m. And, and to another verb. So I could say it's 3 p.m. and was eaten. I don't think you can. <laughs> I mean, do you think that's grammatical? <laughs> what just got eaten? It's 3 p.m. and eaten is like a Lewis Carroll story or something. <laughs> the it being eaten is suddenly meaningful, and so it can't coordinate as an empty dummy it and a meaningful subject it. Yeah, I think that's actually a nice test, because you can say it's 3 p.m. and hot and raining, and all of those are doing the same it. But when you start combining them... I mean, I guess if you say, like, it's hot and eaten, now you're just referring to a specific item and not the general state of affairs. Some people think the it and it's hot or it's raining refers to, like, the weather or the sky. Mm -hmm. But we don't generally go around saying, like, the sky is raining. Well, now I'm going to start. I mean, <laughs> you can change things. <laughs> it's raining is an interesting construction across languages because a lot of languages require you to say something like rain is raining or water's raining. Mm. They don't have that dummy construction, they've solved it in a different way. I should say this is the dummy as in like a like a dressmaker's dummy or like the mannequin in a store window. So it's just sort of propping up the clothes. And you can think of this it as like propping up the rest of the sentence. I also like to think of it as because English is so stressed about not having a subject, like a distressed baby, it needs a pacifier. <laughs> and that's why you give it a dummy. Then I think it's 3pm and eaten is going to stress out English just a little too much. Yeah. So if you want another piece of technical vocabulary, this construction, like it's 3 p.m. and eaten, is known as zugma. So this is something like she put out the light and the cat. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I like that. You like it, but the lawyers would be having a meltdown. <laughs> Let's see if there are any other fun examples. You held your breath and the door for me. I took the podium in my second trophy of the evening. The boy swallowed milk and kisses. So you can sort of use it for multiple functions. But I think normally when Zugma kind of works, it's, I mean, you can do it in the sort of abstract, like put out the light and the cat because one's a figurative use and one's like a physical use. But I think, yeah, it's 3 p.m. in Eden. I have trouble. <laughs> <laughs> it's definitely deliberately playful. I, I don't even know if it's ungrammatical. It's deliberately playful. What's afternoon tea? It's 3 p.m. in Eden. <laughs> Yeah, it seems like there's an omitted at, like it's at 3 p.m. and ready. It's because ready is definitely more of an adjective, whereas eaten is a more nominalized but still verb. 
Yeah, I think it's at 3 p.m. That can refer to like the event is at 3 p.m. So that's changing it into a literal it again. Yeah, well, and the reason I couldn't say it's 3 p.m. and I'm eating it is then you're like, it's a different it. Yeah, you, each of them has its own subject, so that's fine. Yeah, and it's like, oh, he didn't say what he's eating, but he's eating it, you know. Yeah. So as I understand it, you can use the International Phonetic Alphabet to transcribe all the sounds that people use in language. Mm -hmm. How do you rate a cough in IPA? Like, I was looking through the chart and I couldn't figure out, is there a symbol that would go with that sound? A general full-throated cough is not something that is specifically a speech sound in any human language. So there's not... A. That we know of yet. <laughs> that we know of yet, or that someone has not created to raise their child to attempt to turn into normal phonology. So we don't have a specific symbol for a cough in the standard International Phonetic Alphabet as set forward by the International Phonetic Association. However, you have now unlocked, congratulations, the Extended IPA. <laughs> <laughs> I've never heard of the Extended IPA. I don't think we've ever talked about it on an episode, so... Oh, how excellent. This is yet more IPA for your fun and enjoyment. Also for useful technical reasons. <laughs> also useful technical reasons. Are you allowed to tell everyone about this, or is this like, suppose, is this a secret held among linguists? <laughs> so the classic IPA is devised for linguists to talk about sounds that are in the regular speech repertoire of spoken languages. The extended IPA is generally used by speech pathologists to transcribe other sounds that people sometimes make when they're learning to or producing speech differently from how the typical user of their language does it. Speech pathology covers a really wide range. It can be anything from working with children who have lisps and stutters through to helping people post stroke or with aphasia regain the ability to speak. So some sounds, the one that's really memorable for me is that they have gnashing of teeth mm. in XIPA and also smacking lips and other types of like whistled version of S, which I'm not going to demonstrate because A, I don't think I can and mm -hmm. B, it might be kind of painful if you're on headphones. So there's also some sounds in XIPA that are, I think, very difficult to pronounce unless you have a cleft palate because they're bringing the air through through the palate in your mouth, where most people don't have a hole there, or through your nose and mouth at the same time, if you have a cleft palate. So that's where I would look if I was looking for coughing, because it seems like the kind of thing they might have done. Okay. Do they have a whole new set of symbols, or is it mostly the Latin letters turned upside down and stuff? There's a lot of Latin letters turned upside down or back to front, or sometimes they'll use something from the IPA with some additional diacritics and decoration. Yeah, it's a lot of diacritics, like things above and below the original letters. Unfortunately, it's very unglamorous having hyped up the XIPA. There's a whole section for unidentifiable or indeterminate sounds, which are a bunch of symbols in a circle. So if you're not sure what consonant was said, you can just write C in a circle, which is kind of neat. But cough is written as, do you want to, you know, get a pencil and write this down? Okay. Open bracket, open bracket, cough, close bracket, close bracket. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I guess we've already got a way to write that. <laughs> I wish there was some sort of more interesting symbol, but there is kind of this whole thing. They use like music notation for loud speech and soft speech. They have like forte and pianissimo and these sorts of things. This is outside of the XIPA, but if you want a linguist-approved convention for writing laughter in a conversation analysis, they use the at sign. Well, that's true. And I do have a handful of friends who will text me with at, at, at instead of lol. Amazing. So it's handy. So that reminds me of a comics problem, which is... As far as I know, there's no good written onomatopoeia or sound effect for the sound of applause. So like if you want to show applause off screen, in, you know, off panel in a comic, mm -hmm. if there was an explosion, you would write boom, you know, or bang or something. Like yeah. There are sounds for like splashes, like, psh. but there's, yeah. n there's nothing for the sound of applauding. And I don't even know how to suggest it. Usually what cartoonists do is cheat and they'll write. Woo! You know, to imply people <laughs> cheering. As someone who studies language and gesture, I don't think that's cheating. I think that's co-opting the multimodality <laughs> of human expression to advantage in a graphic novel format. 
The other thing you'll sometimes see is people will just write clap, 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 clap. So it's not cheating. It's, you know, it's one of the many ways you can use language. But I feel like it would be so helpful if there were some way to write that sound. Mm. And since you're both linguists, can you make one? (laughs) How would you represent that? Like, okay, if at, at, at is laughing. So representing a sound as a conventionalized spoken form is onomatopoeia. And some languages do this kind of thing far more frequently and more conventionally than English does. So we might want to take a look at a language that does that. I think Japanese is one of those languages that has a lot of idiophones and onomatopoeia. Japanese does this a ton. So the Japanese idiophone onomatopoeia for clapping is pachi pachi. Pachi pachi. That seems about right. Yeah, it seems about right. But the fun thing is also that... Pachi can also refer to eight, the number eight in Japanese, which is more commonly hachi, but it can also be pachi. So if you're texting or you're on social media and you want to indicate applause or clapping, you can also write a bunch of eights. Nice. And at least Japanese speakers will know what you mean by that. I mean, I guess there's also the emoji these days, like people do that as well. The emoji does have those little action lines, but to get those action lines into English, you know, we just made a big deal about Japanese having this onomatopoeic form. But I think clap is also a form of onomatopoeia. We just don't look at it that way. (laughs) Huh. Clap. Oh, no, wait. So the etymology of clap. I've never been on tenterhooks waiting for an etym online definition. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. So the etym online entry for clap has a common Germanic echoic verb, which is also found in Old Frisian, Old High German, Old Saxon, klapunga. And it, yeah, unknown origin, probably (laughs) onomatopoeic. So I think the obvious thing to do is to put clap, 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 footnote down the bottom of the comic, because good comics should have footnotes. You just link to the Edam Online entry. Everyone's happy. (laughs) Yes. Oh, man. So the answer was inside you all along. (laughs) It's like you just start saying clap so fast that you stumble over the sounds. And there you've got it. From a physical articulatory perspective, you're sort of doing a teeny tiny clap with your tongue inside your mouth against the rest of your mouth. Yeah, I mean, because, well, the k is the clapping with the back, and then the p is the the front, and the l is the... Yeah, it's the labio- lateral. The your whole mouth is clapping. Yeah. <laughs> Three or four different parts of your tongue are all doing little taps against the roof of your mouth. So your whole mouth is applauding. That is so cool. Okay, thank you for that. <laughs> you're very welcome. <laughs> So this might be more of a almost a question for a singer, but you mentioned these sounds that are sort of outside the speech register. What's up with the sort of piercing sound of a horror movie scream? Is that falsetto? (laughs) Is that a normal speech sound but louder? Or is that your throat doing something weird? So there's a great paper about screaming, which is brilliantly titled, Human Screams Occupy a Privileged Niche in the Communication Soundscape. (laughs) Which I think begins to answer your question. It suggests that screams are universal and acoustically unique so that they'll alert us to danger and ensure, and I quote, biological and ultimately social efficiency. (laughs) I guess the hope being that like, if someone's screaming, even if you don't speak their language, you can still tell like this is a human distress signal. We normally write a scream from an onomatopoeia perspective as ah, with a lot of A's Mm -hmm. and maybe H's. Because ah is like the most open of the vowels, like the jaw is just fully dropped. Okay. Like it's it's the least restricted. If you tried to scream something like e, you'd have to like have your mouth be a lot more closed. Yeah, you'd never write i i i i i. <laughs> but I guess that's why the e in shriek is like trying to because it's closed, but it also then tends to correlate with perceptually higher pitched things. So that's trying to give you that perception of it being really high pitched, which ah doesn't necessarily do yes yeah, because so, some comics will do a i e e e e e like i trying to get the best of both yeah trying to give the high pitchedness of it the other thing about this paper is that it says that screams are acoustically well segregated from other communication signals as in they're higher pitched than other communication signals and that this is also partly to avoid false alarms because mm. like imagine if like a third of your words just had like the scream bit in them <laughs> and then you'd kind of be like the boy who cries wolf or like oh well if you're screaming all the time nothing's ever urgent 
Yeah, you know what? There are a few animals that make sounds that I think are in that scream register because people get freaked out by them. I think foxes and then elk Mm -hmm. do a weird noise. There's some animals that make sounds like crying babies, which I don't know if that's Mm -hmm. also in the same range, but the... The scream cluster is in 30 to 150 hertz. And so if animals, probably some of them are in that range and you could measure that. And that there's also a perceptual attribute called roughness that screams tend to have. So uh, I really don't want to demonstrate a scream and really freak people out <laughs> listening to the podcast. Uh, but if you think about your latest you know, horror movie scream style, it's got this sort of back and forth modulation that's, that's sort of roughness. I'm curious. It was interesting to realize that I learned from you about how emojis, a lot of them represent gestures Mm -hmm. and how some of them are things we have words for, but some of them aren't. So what are some gestures that people do without realizing this is a type of communication or like without having a word for it? I'm going to tell you the answer, but once I do, you will never unsee this. So I just have to repay you for that fact. There is something that everyone who gestures does all the time, and it has a specific technical name, and that is the repetition in a gesture to indicate duration or emphasis. And this kind of repetition is known as a beat gesture. You will absolutely see it in the most clearest manifestation if you watch a politician give a speech because they love to use them to give a sense of coherence to what they're saying. It's this magic thing. If, you, if you're if you giving a speech, here's a pro tip. You can use beat gestures, and if you continue to use the same repetition on your stressed syllables, I'm doing it now, but you can't see it. Yeah, I, I, Lauren, I feel like you're really emphasizing the beat gestures in a very auditory way. <laughs> I'm emphasizing the beat dresses auditorily, but if you continue to do this gesture repetition – you can actually give the sense that everything you're saying alongside those gestures is the same topic or it's coherent, even though it may not actually be so. Huh. So this is like when you're shaking your hand up and down as you talk and the up and down motion goes with with the syllables. And then suddenly when you do that, I have this urge to vote for you. Vote for Lauren. She can't be beat. (laughs) That's my slogan. (laughs) So you could combine it with a thumbs up if you want to be like, that was a really great job or a pointing gesture. So it combines with other gestures. That's part of why you see it everywhere. But sometimes a person's hands won't be indicating like a pointing gesture or they won't be giving any information about, you know, the size or the shape of something. They're just doing this repetition. And the analogy in emoji is that we use a lot of repetition in our emoji to do the same kind of emphasis or duration. So a string of clapping hands to show applause in emoji or a string of hearts to say, I really love that idea. Is it true that if you make someone hold their hands still when they're talking, they're less coherent or have a harder time forming sentences? I feel like I heard that somewhere. The general suggestion is yes. And I think we've talked about it before and I've said that's the case. I've been returning to this literature and we'll probably revisit it in an episode. But it turns out that there is a lot of variation in what people mean when they say that they've stopped people from gesturing. Mm -hmm. And so there's a lot of variation in just how much it really does change how people speak. Possibly sometimes it's just because they come up with these really fantastically bizarre experiments. (laughs) (laughs) Like there's some where they like tie them down so they can't gesture, right? And maybe being tied down is a bit distracting. Yeah. Oh, yeah. There are some fascinating study designs. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, anytime you have to have anyone do anything in an MRI, their circumstances are not going to be natural to, you know. Well, what you really need to do is just raise someone in an MRI, in like have all the furniture in their house be shaped like an MRI. <laughs> and then they'd be totally comfortable with it. So like they go to sleep and it's in an MRI and their couch where they watch TV is in an MRI. Adding it to my long list of study design ideas that are terrible <laughs> and a lot in this area are fascinatingly bad. <laughs> So a lot of the time I'll read fiction or, you know, watch a movie where there's a fictional language. So if I come across a sample of a language and I'm trying to figure out, is this a real natural human language or is it something that was created Mm -hmm. by a language enthusiast to seem real? If you were hired as like detectives to try to figure it out, what do you look for? What would be the hallmarks of an invented language? This sounds like a great linguist job. (laughs) 
Yeah, well, what would be the hallmarks, the, the giveaways? You know, it's someone who's trying to make it seem like a natural language. So if you were trying to figure out if you're looking at a real language or one by someone who's trying to fool you, what would you look for? I would go straight to trying to find the irregularities. And if there are no irregularities, that's an immediate sign that you have something that is too neat to have been slowly evolved collectively as a communal agreement by a collection of speakers. Especially if there are like some people who do this and some people that do that, because like one of the things with artificial languages is they tend to make like one language. But like as we were talking about with like wine and wine or trying to find the averagest English speaker, like everyone's slightly different with a language. So if you don't have any of that representation of different people are doing this slightly differently and we don't fully know exactly how all of this stuff works, but like here's a bunch of ways that it could be. Yeah, I think I would go probably straight to the pronoun system or how they do copulas. So in English, is, are, be, am, are all copula verbs, but they're all a bit of a hot mess because over time we've created this really unbalanced paradigm or we've taken two different verbs and turned them into the past and the present of the current one or with pronouns. You know, we have, we just borrowed they from one of the Scandinavian languages and you can't actually find a robust explanation for where she came from in the English paradigm. And yeah, we just I don't and know. me are incredibly ill-balanced. And if you have a completely neat, like, I have all these pronouns and they're perfectly clear which one is me and which one is you and which one's single and which one's plural. I'm like, oh, that is... That is suspiciously regular, and language is very good at being irregular in these high-use areas. It's like a house that no one lives in because it's like suspiciously tidy. And I think also like the high-use areas, like in a house that you live in, tend to have more regularity going on. I think it's sort of the difference between like a stair rail or something that's been polished by like generations of people walking by it and having their hand on it, and like some areas will be smoother than others. Mm -hmm. Like it's hard to get that kind of patina of use without lots of people doing it. I find the best way to do that when I'm constructing languages for fictional worlds is just to bring a degree of absent-mindedness to my work. So <laughs> I might just generate the pronoun paradigm twice and then take the bits I like of both of them, but then randomly forget some time and, and use another form. So there's one completely irregular one in there. <laughs> oh, that makes sense. Yeah. Now and then I see people complain about like, oh, this show is unrealistic because the characters pronounce this one character's name two different ways. You know, like in Star Wars, some of them say Han Solo and some of them say Han Solo. And that's because they haven't prepared well enough. It's just two different parts of the galaxy. Yeah. As somebody named Lauren Gone, or as you say it, Lauren Gone. <laughs> yes, people never pronounce real people's names differently depending on their accent. People would never have a Gone Gone merger. <laughs> that would be completely unrealistic for my co-host to use the incorrect vowel in pronouncing my name. Because <laughs> I don't have your Gone vowel. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, that kind of irregularity. I do have to say, sometimes there is implausible irregularity. So in Game of Thrones, I found it comedically implausible that every single member of Arya Stark's family would pronounce her first name differently. Mm -hmm. But I can totally believe there is an entire galaxy where there are two different ways to pronounce Han or Han. Yeah. So it's like the difference between there being, oh, a couple of different accents. You know, some people say this name this way. Some people say Han. Some people say Han versus like these people have clearly not met Aria, because they all say it differently. Her own family members don't seem to know. Yeah. yeah, and like, and the reasons are often motivated in some sort of factor. Like, if you have characters, okay, people who are in this group do this, people who are in that group do this, but like, why do these characters who all grew up together in the same environment, why do they talk so differently if they all grew up together? And like, maybe there's some sort of other reason, right? Mm -hmm. But like, what sort of factors are influencing how people are, are talking differently? Or like, oh, we just happened to hire a bunch of actors from different places, whatever. And like, sometimes you get a show that does that sort of accent neutral casting or accent indifferent casting. But if you want to create within world story reasons for people, you know, oh, we're going to give all the good guys British <laughs> accents. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, a bit of randomness and whimsy definitely helps bring a language to life. Yeah, that's a really clever thing to look for. I, it's nice to know that you could just be a little bit less fastidious and, and actually make it seem more real. So let's just suppose optimistically that this podcast recording survives for 50 or 100 years. Like I always think it's funny, we're sitting here recording this at a specific time and place, but it's going to be listened to in the future. That's true. And we don't actually know how far in the future. You know, people will listen when it's posted, but it'll then it'll sit around. So I thought it would be fun 
keeping in mind those people, you know, 50 or 100 years in the future, that if we try to make guesses about features of English that seem unusual to us, Mm -hmm. but will seem like normal usage to the listeners in 2072 or Mm. 2122. So we could make our guesses about what we think usage is going to look like. Um, And then in 100 years, the listeners can grade us on who got closest (laughs) to correct. (laughs) So it's like a contest. We wouldn't get our scores for uh, 100 years. Please, if you're listening to this in 100 years, you know, maybe human life expectancy will have gone up and we'll still be around. (laughs) And be sure to post this episode on the intergalactic hollow sphere. <laughs> Share it with your friends via your brain implant. Okay. <laughs> Don't forget to like, subscribe, and merge the podcast with your consciousness at the galactic core. <laughs> <laughs> so I actually have a suggestion that might even work on a shorter time frame. So we might be around in, say, 20 years or 30 years to hear the answers to some of these. Okay which would be kind of exciting. One of the fastest changing areas of language is that there's a new word for cool about every decade or so, sometimes less. Mm -hmm. And I was writing another article where I had to sort of project the future of English. And I thought, you know, if we go back and we look at sort of a list of words for cool, do they have any sort of features in common so we could predict what the new cool word for cool might be? So some words for cool that may not be cool anymore, things like sick, hot, lit, rad, sweet, tight, nice, neat. And then there's also sort of another subset like nifty, keen, nifty, groovy. So apart from nifty and groovy, which both have this sort of E sound at the end, all of these other words are very like consonant, vowel, consonant from a pronunciation perspective, sometimes with like an extra consonant at the beginning or end. So sometimes there's like two, like sick, lit, rad, sweet, nice, neat. They've all got this sort of bookended consonants on either side. So if we come up with some other words that are monosyllables with consonants on either side, maybe one of these words will eventually turn into the word for cool. (laughs) This will be like the first time that I've ever been cool in my life. (laughs) Mm -hmm. And we can can come up with some of them. I think the current word that the kids mm, are using these days is based, which is Mm -hmm. like the opposite of cringe. It's like based in fact, sometimes used (laughs) meta-ironically, attributed to the rapper Lil B. I'm getting this from Urban Dictionary because, again, like I don't think we're particularly cool here. (laughs) So... I've come up with some additional candidates, and if you wish to contribute any, you also can, of like words that have the right phonetic form that could turn into a word for cool, maybe. But maybe there are more. And they don't have to mean something that sounds good, right? Because like sick or something doesn't sound good. Okay, what have you got? So sop seems like it's got potential. Numb? I don't know. I just feel like numb could mean cool. Left? I don't know. Maybe it's kind of out from left field or sort of bizarre. As a left-handed person, I kind of like this one. I was going to say, I feel like this is your left-handed affirmation coming through here. (laughs) Thank you. (laughs) Uh, Sunk? Oh, yeah. I don't know. Sunk could mean cool. Like These these have got some some good acoustics to them. Oh, getting a new meaning for, yeah, this like the sunk cost fallacy becomes like the sunk (laughs) cost positive thing. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, like, wow, that's so sunk, man. I can't believe it. (laughs) Okay, I have a very long bow to draw here, and I don't think I'm going to win with this, but I would like to propose whale, as in the ocean-going mammal, because okay, there are some people who still pronounce that as whale, and then I'll have a really obvious token <laughs> to check if we fully reduce the wine-wine merger. So that's my... Wow, that's so whale of you. <laughs> I just want to make sure we have a lot of tokens of something that has a WH pronunciation for some people to to make sure that we've definitely closed that merger or it's been demerged. Mm. I mean, some people are using like the the Beowulf what, like ironically now. So we oh, could yeah, maybe we could get that going. Mm-hmm. Bring some of the stuff back. Or hey, this can be my opening. If you know America has finished merging caught and caught, then we could bring back caught to mean cool. Oh, yeah, that's so caught of you. No, no, no. You got to unmerge it. That's so caught of you. You know, the weird thing is when you're describing this, you're using the word cool a lot. And it strikes me that like that word 
has hung on for a weirdly long time Mm -hmm. and means the same thing. And like there are all these other synonyms that come and go. But that one, like when I read, you know, old newspapers going back at least, you know, five or six decades has basically the same connotation. Yeah, and it's interesting that that cool retains its meaning as sort of the meta term for this category. Whereas like if I say something's groovy now, I'm implying it's dated. I'm not saying it's still cool. Yeah. I mean, like, I don't know if there are any more like temperature words. I think that mine has been pretty much exhausted. I mean, unless you're going to start saying something's warm. Yeah. Like cool, chill, hot. Tepid, man. (laughs) (laughs) I think that's like the wrong phonetic Actually, Luke fits and it's now only in the context of lukewarm. So... Yeah, that's so Luke. Sorry, Luke's out there. I mean, if you're going for the phonetic profile, I think damp fits. So <laughs> That's so damp, man. <laughs> oh, wait, no, because that, I mean, that's very similar to dank. Mm. That's very similar to dank. Yeah, dank's already there. The things people can semantically shift when they set their minds to it are truly astounding. But yeah, like you really can't predict what's going to be in cool, but they do seem to have some sort of phonetic signature. So if any of these words that we've mentioned turn into a word for cool, I definitely didn't see bass coming, so, you know, who knows? That would be very whale. <laughs> we get bragging rights to be very whale. Yeah, that was that was real tepid of you. <laughs> <laughs> well, to put my stake in the ground, my prediction, when I was a little kid, you could tell if someone learned from reading mm. because they would pronounce certain words ways that, like, they'd say debris instead of debris mm-hmm. because they hadn't heard someone say it. They had only read it. And I feel like we're conducting so much written communication now. I wonder if more of those will just become alternate accepted pronunciations. Ooh, good one. So like Debris, facade instead of facade. <laughs> if you were me when I was a kid saying centrifugal instead of centrifugal. Yeah, exactly. Grand finale. There's one that's already sort of there, which is forte. Oh, yeah. I only just learned that I've been saying that one wrong. What would be a non-forte pronunciation of? Forte. Fort, I think, right? Because it's originally Italian. And in Italian, it's both spelled forte and pronounced forte. But a lot of people write it with an accent mark as if it was French, like cafe or resume, which gets written with the accent mark. And you can understand why you'd want to do this because the E there isn't silent, but it's not actually originally a French word. Yes. So yeah, I like the reader's pronunciation argument. This makes me feel much cooler than coming up with words for cool. Well, mispronunciation is my forte. (laughs) I guess if you're listening to this in a hundred years from when it was released, uh, email contact at Lingthusiasm to let us know which of us is closest. (laughs) (laughs) For more Lingthusiasm and links to all the things mentioned in this episode, go to Lingthusiasm.com. You can listen to us on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, SoundCloud, YouTube, or wherever else you get your podcasts, and you can follow at Lingthusiasm on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and Tumblr. You can get tree structure scarves, not judging your grammar notebooks, and Kiki Booba mugs, and other Lingthusiasm merch at Lingthusiasm.com slash merch. I tweet and blog as Superlinguo. I can be found as at Greta Namixie on Twitter, my blog is allthingslinguistic.com, and my book about internet language is called Because Internet. You can follow our guest, Randall Monroe, at XKCD on various social media sites, and his new book is called What If 2. Have you listened to all the Lingthusiasm episodes and you wish there were more? You can get access to an extra Lingthusiasm episode to listen to every month, plus our entire archive of bonus episodes to listen to right now at patreon.com slash Lingthusiasm, or follow the links from our website. Have you gotten really into linguistics and you wish you had more people to talk to about it? Patrons can also get access to our Discord chat room to talk with other linguistics fans. Plus, all patrons help keep the show ad-free. Recent bonus topics include a chat about the design of the IPA chart and what it's like to be in an MRI machine. Can't afford to pledge? That's okay, too. We also really appreciate it if you can recommend Lingthusiasm to anyone in your life who's curious about language. Lingthusiasm is created and produced by Gretchen McCulloch and Lauren Gorn. Our senior producer is Claire Gorn. Our editorial producer is Sarah Doppiarella. Our production assistant is Martha Sutsui Billins. And our production manager is Liz McCullough. Our music is Ancient City by The Triangles. Stay Lingthusiastic! Lingthusiastic!